Well, it's time now for another grisly tale. Alan Robson with you. Thanks for joining me again. Tonight's just something that I would ask you first. If it was your very last day on earth, if you had to take a walk to the gallows or face lethal injection, what would your last ever meal be? There are a lot of very famous killers and murderers who've had a wide variety of things. Garlic bread, shrimp, French fries, ice cream, whipped cream with strawberries. That was the last order of Perry Smith and Richard Eugene Hickok before their double hanging in Kansas back in 1965. The meal arrived, it was beautifully cooked, but at the last moment, both of their appetites died before they did, and the meal remained untouched. Barbara Graham was convicted of murder. She was a murderess. She was executed by lethal gas at San Quentin in California, in 1955, but not until she'd had her hot fudge Sunday. It was ham, eggs, toast, and a cup of strong coffee. Guy John, the Chinese murderer, the first man ever to be executed in America by the use of gas, back in 1924 in Carson City State Prison. Candy Chauncey Millard was the youngest person ever to be executed in Utah. Not hanged, nor a lethal injection, killed by a firing squad back in 1869. The 18-year-old was still eating his candy bar when the shots rang out. He didn't finish it. Makes you wonder what you would have, though. Cheesy Doodles and Coca-Cola was the choice of the mass poisoner, Margaret Velma Barfield, this 52-year-old granny, the first woman ever to die by lethal injection. I was in North Carolina in 62. A large steak salad, potato pancakes, and two helpings of jelly and ice cream. Isadora Zimmerman downed that lot a 26-year-old convicted of murder at Sing Sing in 1939. She protested her innocence as she ate. After eating her last mouthful, she said, I will go and die for you now. But you gotta know, I didn't do this. Scary, isn't it? I'll give you one more. An American dollar bill sandwich. Bread, butter, a little bit of meal, and a one dollar piece. Joshua Jones was hanged in Pennsylvania back in 1939 for murdering his wife. And while he waited for his execution, he sold his body to the prison doctors for ten dollars so that they could experiment on it. He spent nine dollars on delicacies to make sure that his diet while he was in prison was a nice varied one and he got nice stuff instead of the slop the rest got. Realising that he still had one dollar left in his pocket, just before he was executed, he requested two slices of bread and ate the last dollar that he had. So, kind of like the adverts that you have before the big movie just a few tasters for you because tonight I've got a story that is an amazing tale and once again it shows you how any of us can kill tonight it is the ultimate creeper the story of Crippin now to have a name like Holy Harvey Crippen, 
and to be born in cold water in Michigan back in 1862. It's the name of a doctor, isn't it? It's the name of, of someone of purpose. And he went to medical school, won a batch of diplomas at Cleveland, London, and also in New York. But strictly speaking, he wasn't qualified to be a doctor. He wasn't qualified to practice. His dad sold dry goods. He was called Myron. And in 1887, young Crippen, the wannabe doctor, married Charlotte Bell, his first wife. They had a son called Otto, and she died of influenza in 1890, only three years into the marriage. A few years later, in Jersey City, Crippen married again. A rather loud and blousy woman called Cora Turner. He'd first met her when she was 17 and living with another man. Her real name was Kunagunde Makamotsky, from Eastern Europe. Her father, a Russian Pole, a mother German. Kripin paid for Cora to train as an opera singer. But her voice wasn't up to it, but she wanted to be an opera singer, and she made damn sure that he paid for lessons. Her voice, even after the lessons, was described as horrific. She tried to make it as a music hall artist. She called herself Belle Elmore, sang in various halls around London, but she just didn't have the voice. She had a small, small voice. Even though when she spoke, she was loud with a sharp American accent. She wasn't particularly pretty. She was short and stout. Really dark, noticeable eyes. Long hair, bright jewels and a lot of bling. Colourful clothes. Somebody once described her as a fat bird of paradise. Not terribly nice. She was flamboyant, so people noticed her, so they made remarks about her. And Crippen tolerated all of this. Crippen was certainly shorter than she was. He was only about five foot two. And a lot of people said he was a bit camp, slightly feminine, his hair thinning and a straggly, limp kind of moustache. He had grey eyes and he wore gold-rimmed glasses that seemed to make them huge. A lot of people said he was slovenly and certainly didn't have the demeanour of a proper doctor. He worked for a medicine company, a, a company called Munions. They paid him three quid a week and partnered up with Dr Rylance, a Yale tooth specialist in New Oxford Street. In 1905, the Crippens moved to Hills, Hillsdrop Crescent. It was a semi that they rented for £52, 10 shillings a year. The Crescent connected with Camden Road and it was less than half a mile from Holloway Prison. He always insisted that he had a separate bedroom from his wife because they had frequent rows. She went in and out just as she liked. She did what she liked. And Crippen said, and whatever the bitch did, it meant nothing to me. He said, at the time, I was rather a lonely man and rather miserable. By this time, Mrs. Crippen had had a lot of big, loud musical friends. During the artist's strike at the Bedford and Eustace Palace, she was hissed for being in a black leg. She was one of the few people that would work the stage. She was an unpleasant woman. She persuaded Crippen to become a Roman Catholic so they would entertain a lot at home for their social nights. But their private lives were unpleasant too spent in dingy in a disorderly basement kitchen. The grimy, filthy windows were never opened nor cleaned. She disliked having what he described as fresh air. 
Her two cats were never let out, so the place stank. And her gentlemen friends were let in. When Dr. Crippen was at work, they would give her gifts. They would give her cash. They were obviously giving him a bit more than that. Her husband had now also found somebody else. He'd fallen in love with a typist who'd worked for him for more than seven years, Ethel and Eve. A boyish-looking woman, slightly taller than he was, but at least she was kind. By 1910, she'd been his mistress for nearly three years. She was 27. He just turned 48. Mrs. Crippen was 35. A lot of people think it was because Ethel and Eve had got to a point where she was needing a bit more than just being the bit on the side. She didn't just want to remain a mistress all her life. And Mrs. Crippen, aware of her husband's association with the typist, threatened to leave, to go and live with one of her gentlemen and take all her money with her. Most of their money, £600, was in fact banked in a joint deposit account. But she had somehow contributed £330 that he knew nothing about. On December in 1909, she gave 12 months' notice of withdrawal of the whole amount. Then that would have been paid to her without question in December 1910, even if she went there on her own. Crippen, on the other hand, was in a bit of trouble. Financially, entertaining Ethel was an expensive thing because they made love in hotels. And in November 1909, Munyon stopped employing him as a manager and only paid him commission on the stuff he sold. And even those payments came to an end on the 31st of January back in 1910. That night, the Crippens had another one of their razzle-dazzle fancy and rather gaudy dinner parties for two retired music hall stars, Mr and Mrs Paul Martinetti. Dinner served in the breakfast room next to the kitchen and then they went upstairs to the parlour where they all played whist around a table. The Martinetti said at the time, it was quite a nice evening, Belle was very jolly, we left at about half past one, we said our goodbyes on the gaslit front doorsteps that laid down to a really dark street and we shouted, don't come down Belle, you'll catch it cold, we'll see you again soon. The pair of them also admitted to, on hearing the door shut, a horrific marital row started, Mrs Crippen accusing her husband of not having escorted the elderly Mr Martinetti upstairs to the lavatory. And he went there earlier that evening. She abused me, said Crippen, when he made his very first statement to the police. She said, this is the finish of it. I won't stand it any longer. I shall leave you tomorrow and you will never hear of me again. Now, she'd said this so often, I didn't take any notice of it at all. But she did say one thing that she'd never said before. That I was to arrange to cover up any scandal with our mutual friends and the Guild the best way that I could. Now, a fortnight before this, the creeping about behind his wife's back led him to a chemist where he purchased five grains of a narcotic poison that's called hyoscine. It's normally used for homeopathic medicine and he got it from a shop on the New Oxford Street called Lewis and Burroughs. Now, they had none in stock but they got the poison in and delivered the crystals to Crippen's hand and they asked him to come back on the 19th of January where he had to sign the poisons register. The night after they'd had such a good time with the Martinettis, Crippen popped in at the Martinettis flat up in Shaftesbury Avenue to make sure that Mr Martinetti was all right. His wife said, oh well how's Belle? She's all right, he said. And on the 2nd and 9th of February, Crippen pawned some of his wife's jewellery in Oxford Street 
and he managed to get £195 for it, more than he used to earn from Munions in a year. And then, on the afternoon of the 2nd of February, Bell Crippen didn't turn up at the Music Hall Ladies' Guild. It was held every Wednesday at Albion House, in a room that was lent out by Dr Crippen. Miss Leneve, however, appeared with two letters signed by Belle Elmore, but not in her handwriting, which said that she'd been obliged to go to America because of a relative's illness and would have to resign from the Guild. Crippen later said that Miss Leneve spent the night with him at 39 Hilldrop Crescent. She stayed other nights too, and there were many witnesses of this, and he also started to give her any of his wife's better jewellery, any of the clothes that would fit the stick-thin girl. Bell's friends thought it was odd when they didn't hear from her, not a single letter, not a postcard. They were amazed, especially on the 20th of February at a big ball that was organised by the Guild at the Criterion. And there they saw Dr Crippen with his secretary, Miss Linev, wearing a beautiful brooch. And that brooch had belonged to his wife, Belle. They would later see various skirts, dresses, shoes, hats, and even some of Belle's furs worn by the increasingly confident Miss Linev. They asked for more news. Where was Belle? Can we have an address? Can we contact her? We miss her so much. Crippen said she was right up in the wilds of the mountains of California. And a few weeks later, when they asked again, so they never stopped asking, he said that she was actually quite ill. She was suffering a double pneumonia. Now, back then, a single pneumonia was likely going to cost you life. A double pneumonia made them want to contact her even more. Oh, we hate to think that she's out there all on her own. We must get in touch. He kept stum. And then, in March, Miss Lenev moved permanently into 39 Hilldrop Crescent, sometimes posing as a housekeeper, although now she herself had acquired a French maid. Now, February, she'd spent a few nights in her own lodging before she left them, finally. She told her landlady, Mrs Jackson, that she could have some of her clothes. Six coats, six skirts, five blouses, 18 hats, 10 pairs of stockings, eight nightgowns. And he, she said to her that she's moving in with her man because his wife had left him to go to America. Mrs. Jackson said that Ethel had been much depressed and in tears in January. Very tired, in a strange mood. And when I see them go away together, it makes me realise what my position is, she once said. His wife's threatening to go away. I wish she would, and when she does, the doctor's going to divorce her and marry me. The difference between her demeanour uh, from January, where she was miserable and suicidal, to the way she was behaving in February, cheerful, cracking jokes, really happy. She'd even said, has that someone gone to America? And Ethel shook her head. Wednesday, the 16th of March, Dr. Cripp had gave his landlord Noticed that he was going to leave within three months. And on Thursday, he and Ethel, calling themselves Mr and Mrs Crippen, went off to France for five days over Easter, visiting a few small towns and spending a couple of nights in Dieppe. That very morning, Mrs Martinetti received a telegram sent from Victoria Station. Bell died yesterday at six o'clock. I'll be away for a week. See you when I get back. Peter. It's thought that during 
the crossing to France, Bell's head was placed in a weighted handbag that Crippen had dropped overboard. A few people say they saw blood dripping from it, yet thought nothing of it because Crippen himself had a bandage on his hand. Now, during the absence of any notice of her death, when they returned from France, Crippen set about trying to shut up the morning friends to try and stop their calls, to try and stop all of the uh, caned, so-called caned, letters of condolence. If there's anything we can do, if ever you need something to eat, you can always come round ours. You can spend a few days here if you wish. People were very kind, and he hated it. He wanted that chapter in his life to be over, and certainly Miss Lenev did too. Three months had passed, Crippen felt quite secure. He thought that he and his woman were now in a good place. So he arranged with his landlord to stay on a bit longer at Hilldrop Crescent. He's going to stay till September. But ten days later, Mr and Mrs Nash, probably his ex-wife's best friends, returned from America, where she'd been touring in the music halls playing the role of Lil Hawthorne. She called and questioned Crippen at length. Well, where did she go to in America? Where was she working? Who saw her there? Who was putting her up? What was her address? Who told you she was ill? A lot of big questions. And Crippen could barely answer any of them. She was totally dissatisfied with anything that the doctor had said, the so-called doctor. So, Mr Nash decided to tell one of his friends how unhappy he was about this woman's disappearance. Now, this guy's friend wasn't just a casual friend. He was Detective Superintendent Frost of Scotland Yard. Now, Frost himself had just been placed in charge of a brand new squad called the Serious Crimes Squad. And could this be one of them serious crimes that he could unearth? So, the Chief Inspector was asked to investigate further. And he visited Hilldrop Crescent in July. And there he met a French maid and Ethel Eve, who was wearing once again, one of Crippen's ex-wives' brooches. Ethel said she was the housekeeper. She had agreed to accompany the police to Albion House. The three of them went by local bus, and when they got to the building, Ethel ran up the stairs to the third-floor office to let the doctor know who'd come to see him. Now, the chief inspector was called Walter Dew, and he knew the reason for Jew's visit. And Crippen said, I suppose I'd better tell you the truth then. Jew said, of course, that would be the best course. And he says, the stories I've told about her death are untrue. As far as I know, she's still alive. In between teeth pulling and making up prescriptions helped by Miss Lenev, the doctor dictated a long statement took nearly, nearly half a day. They even had to break for lunch and they took Jude to an Italian restaurant and bought him a salami sandwich. The doctor said that Mrs. Scribbon had left him for another man and she disappeared by the time he came back from work on the 1st of February. I sat down to think it over as how to cover up her absence without any scandal. At the end of the statement the end of a long, long day. Crippen and his assistant housekeeper accompanied two policemen back to Hilldrop Crescent and allowed the house to be searched. Crippen and Ethel watched from a doorway as they looked down in the coal cellar. The only thing that seemed 
weird to him was that the woman had left so many beautiful outfits behind. He left the house, fairly satisfied that there was nothing wrong, although he did wonder why Crippen had gone to such lengths to hide the reason for his wife's disappearance, especially as he seemed to be making the most of her absence with the rather statuesque Miss Lenev. The police thought about it. Could he be lying? He looks like he's telling the truth. They decided, just to be sure, they'd make a few more inquiries. He was uh, amazed to hear from Crippen's partner, Dr. Rylands, that on the previous Saturday, Rylands had got a letter from Crippen telling him to wind up his business affairs and his household accounts. In order to escape trouble, I shall be obliged to absent myself for a time. Now, June learned that Crippen had also sent the office boy out to buy some clothing suitable for a boy. He came back to Hilltop Crescent. There was the French maid, who the police had sent back to France. Crippen and Ethel, no sign of either of them. Because... At that time, they were actually in Belgium, staying at the very posh Hotel des Ardennes in Brussels, in Bruxelles. And they had a fairly roundy, shouty, screamy lovemaking time for about eight days. Staff, on two occasions, had to ask them to try and keep the noise down. Now, travel between countries was getting easier and easier. You didn't even need a passport back then. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Crippen's house and gardens were searched by the police. Jew was persistent. And it produced a result far better than anything that he could possibly have thought. He went back down into that dark, nasty, cool cellar. And he started porking at the bricks on the cellar floor with the porker from the fire upstairs and he noticed that one or two of the bricks were loose. He and Detective Sergeant Mitchell prized some of them out. As soon as they lifted the first brick they wanted to puke. There was a stinking heap of desiccating human flesh you could clearly see viscera, intestines wrapped around another rock. Pieces of skin flaking off bone and human hair. But no bones. Joe and Mitchell got out into the fresh air, vomited, drank a few glasses of water, if to tell the truth, he also had half a bottle of Crippen's brandy. They had found all that was left of Crippen's wife, Belle. Medical experts poured to the place to examine the remains. A man called Dr. Pepper, Dr. Bernard Spilsbury. And it was his appearance in court where the first evidence was given for the prosecution in what would later become a major and key murder trial. Spilsbury concluded that the remains were those of a stout, rather chubby female who had hair that had been often bleached and she'd also had an abdominal operation. There were still traces of her lower body where her ovaries had been removed, a scar telling that story. Under the microscope, traces of hyacine, enough to kill her, were found in various organs. They may well have been taken orally. They would never have been spotted if they were in a sugary coffee or a sweet tea. Now, the hyacine has an effect on the human body. 
to make it delirious and then extremely drowsy and within a half an hour you'd be unconscious you'd end up awake but paralyzed and unable to do anything about it and eventually you would die however it's thought that Crippet may well have started working on her to finish her off and cut her to pieces whilst she was in that paralyzed state looking up seeing him with scalpels peeling away skin removing bones from her fingers and toes peeling the skin from her face cutting out her eyeballs cutting off her lips cutting her nose off scalping her taking all of the hair from her body and her still alive feeling every ounce of agony but paralyzed and unable to do anything about it by the 16th of July they issued a warrant for Crippen's arrest and the arrest of Ethel and Eve wanted for murder and not just murder murder and mutilation it made the front pages of every newspaper the police bill described Ethel and Eve five foot five pale faced with light brown hair large grey blue eyes nice looking pleasant ladylike appearance quiet with a subdued manner speaks quietly and looks at you intently when in conversation but where were they on Wednesday the 20th of July the SS Montrose had sailed from Antwerp in Belgium heading to Canada to Quebec and two hours later the ship's commander Captain Kendall had a chat with some of his men because he was suspicious about a couple of the passengers behaving in a peculiar manner the two passengers concerned Mr. John Philo Robinson and his 16 year old son John now they both come on board with brown suits and grey hats and white canvas shoes that telltale weedy moustache that was so tiny it looked like one of his eyebrows had come down for a drink had been shaved off it's just as a man and his son the couple appeared unusually affectionate to one another touching one another in private areas even kissing but kissing unlike any father's ever kissed a son now captain kendall decided he would send a wireless message to the ship's owners in liverpool and you got to remember this is one of the first times that the radio had ever been used to capture anyone and he said to the owners I'm fairly sure the wanted couple Crippen and Lenev are the Robinsons and this is what he wrote the precise wording she seems thoroughly under his thumb and he will not leave her for a moment her suit is anything but a good fit her trousers very tight about the hips are split a bit down the back and secured with large safety pins he continually shaves his upper lip and his beard is growing nicely the mark on his nose caused through wearing spectacles has not worn off he sits on deck reading the pickwick papers metropolis a name to conjure with and the four just men when my suspicions were aroused i quietly collected all the english papers that mentioned the murder all the boys manners at table were rather ladylike cribbon kept cracking nuts for her and giving her half his salad on two or three occasions when walking on the deck i called after him by his assumed name and he took no notice I repeated it and it was only owing to the presence of mind of Miss Lenev that he turned round. 
He would often sit on deck and look up aloft at the wireless aerial and listening to the crackling electric spark of messages being sent by the Marconi operator. He actually said to me on one occasion, what a wonderful invention it is. Little did he know it could have been that that would end his life. The voyage was only 11 days and the chase of Crippen featured every morning in the Daily Mail. Yet, it was still not out in the press where he was. The ship steamed up the winding St. Lawrence River towards Quebec. And then the pilot came on board and Dew, the policeman, dressed as a pilot too. He'd sailed from Liverpool on a faster ship, the SS Laurentic. And there on the deck was Mr. Robinson looking at the sight of the land. In a few hours he would be safe. Master Robinson, the young lad, was in cabin number five reading a novel. Who are all these people? Crippen asked the ship surgeon. Oh, it's the pilot boat. There seems to be a good many pilots, said Crippen. Once the police officer got on board, he met with Captain Kendall and they looked down onto the deck where he saw the man that he almost certainly knew. He descended uh, the companionway and he approached the man who looked kind of strange without the moustache. Good morning, Dr. Crippen, he said. I am Chief Inspector Dew. It was the finest moment of a policeman's life. Because Crippen took a step back, almost like he was going to try to avoid somebody punching him in the face. And he said, Good morning, Mr. Dew. He was arrested there and charged, helped by the good Captain Kendall. Inspector Dew then came down to the cavern and found Miss Lenev. She was dressed in a tatty, badly fitted suit. Miss Lenev, I'm Chief Inspector Dew. She looked up, screamed and fainted on staring out of the porthole Seeing the land appear, she was certain that they'd got away with it. They were held in a prison in Quebec for almost three weeks. And then Crippen and Lenev were brought back to England on the return journey of the SS Megantic. To avoid adverse publicity, they were given new names again. Crippen was told his name was Mr. Neild. And Inspector Dew was Mr. Doyle. Crippen spent the entire journey reading a lot. Mostly rather foppish and wet women's love stories. He had a few pleasant conversations with Dew. But he was kept away from the great love of his life, Ethel Nev, who was guarded by wardresses and he would never be allowed to see her. One day on the deck, Crippen was taking his exercise, walking up and down, and handcuffed to Dew. And he stopped and he said to the policeman, I don't know how things may go. They may go right or they may go all wrong with me. I want to ask you if you let me see her. I won't speak to her. She's been my only comfort for the past three years. And Dew, taken by Crippen, said, OK. And Crippen was walked in handcuffs to the door of his cabin that night. And Ethel to the door of hers. They were about five to six yards apart. And they just seemed to stare at each other. Nobody spoke. They didn't have much really to say. Dew, the police officer, 
felt uncomfortable by the whole thing. He was a bit embarrassed. He just looked away as the couple just stared lovingly at one another. They wouldn't see each other again until they were in court. Back in Britain, there, huge crowds, mobs along the streets, throwing things, booing, trying to tip over the cart to stop the arrival of Crippen and his mistress. They were besieged at Liverpool. When they got to Euston Station, they were almost attacked, but they were committed for trial. A few months later, Mrs. Crippen's remains, still stinking, were interred at the cemetery in Finchley. A few pieces of skin were remained as evidence, and they were passed to jurors in a soup plate. Crippen at the Old Bailey. It had just been reopened by the King, Edward VII, in 1907. And there, before the new Lord Chief Justice, Lord Alverston, Muir appeared for the Crown and Tobin for the defence. Miss Lenev was to be tried separately and only with being an accessory after the fact. Crippen was back looking like Crippen. A huge bushy moustache once splitting his face. He said that there was no proof that the remains in the cellar were those of a woman, let alone his wife. He said they'd been buried without his knowledge even probably before he came to the house. Now, the prosecution came up with the fact that three pieces of pyjamas had been mixed in with the remains. Now, they'd been sent to his house, 39 Hilldrop Crescent, by Jones Brothers of Holloway in 1909, not in 1905, as Crippen had claimed. After five days of going back and forth, Crippen was found guilty. The jury only took 27 minutes, and when they came back, he was sentenced to death. I will still forever protest my innocence, he said, but knew it was all over. Then... The trial of Ethel and Nev began, 25th of October. They had the same people representing them, the same judge, the same prosecutor. But she was defended by Mr. F. E. Smith, King's counsel. The trial lasted a day. She didn't give any evidence at all. She was acquitted and freed. She said she didn't know anything about it. She presumed what her man had said about his ex was true and that she would be appalled if anything had happened to his ex especially by his hand for he was such a gentle man so Cribben appealed of course the appeal was heard and dismissed within 15 minutes he was hanged at Pentonville prison on the 23rd of November in 1910, the first ever caught, the first ever captured by use of radio. But three days before he was hanged, he made a public statement stating that Ethel and Nev had been entirely innocent and he extolled their love. A beautiful love it must have been. This is what he wrote. This love was not of a debased or degraded character. It was a good love. Her mind was beautiful to me. Whatever sin there was, and we broke the law, it was my sin, not hers. As I face eternity, I say that Ethel and Eve has loved me as few women love men, and that her innocence of any crime is absolute. Surely such love as hers for me 
will be rewarded. And then, instead of a meal, they offered him a meal. What do you want as your last meal? He said, I don't want a last meal. Instead, I want a piece of paper so I can write, finally, one last time to the woman that I love. He wrote this just before his execution instead of his breakfast. There is so little time left. Only one more letter I could write to you. Your letter, written on Saturday, came to me last Saturday evening, and soon after that the governor brought me the dreadful news about ten o'clock that I was about to hang. When he had gone, I kissed your face in the photo. It was some consolation, although in spite of all of my greatest efforts, it was impossible to keep down a great sob and my heart's agonised cry. And because he didn't have breakfast, they said, are you sure you don't want something to eat? And he said, I have only one final request. And that is that Ethel and Ev's photograph and letters can be buried with me. And they were. Ethel and Nev travelled by herself to Australia after that, never really able to get out from the public gaze. She died in 1950. It's said that around Finchley Cemetery, Bell Crippen, his wife, desperate for any publicity, desperate to entertain, it's said that her spirit still walks around there, loud and blousy, and people have been touched or have heard outrageous giggling coming from Finchley Cemetery. Crippen, when he was at the hangman, the rope they used was a new rope, and it hadn't been worn in. And it said that it, had he been a heavier man, it would have taken his head off, as it almost did. The body hanging from the head by sinew and muscle alone. The price you pay for taking a life and another grizzly tail.